I think any booktube video out there that has a lot of books in it is fair game for you to leech onto. For example, a monthly wrap-up, a Friday read, a TBR, a book haul, any of those. I think if it's a, just a full review of one or two books, this tag isn't going to work with that so much. And if it's a traditional tag... Hi guys, Dane here and welcome to part number five of my bookshelf tour. So, in my last one... What did we do in my last one? We did uh, Charles Bukowski and William S. Burroughs. We're now officially down to a point where you can't see the uh, shelf where it's out. Actually, let me lift this up. There you go. You may notice that there are like two books left on the shelf and that's just by the very nature of having lots of books that when I uh, read, say for example, I read Margaret Atwood, she has to go right on that top shelf because it's all alphabetical. And then that ends up pushing everything else along. So. Yeah, we're just gonna have to uh, have to make do. But anyway, let's get started on this one because this is an exciting one. I really have been looking forward to filming this shelf. By the way, I'm just gonna point out here before I get started that this is definitely a labour of love because these videos probably take longer than any of my other videos to film and edit and get all the information right, and they don't get many views. But I really like watching other people's bookshelf tours, so we're just gonna style it out and keep going. Book number one for this little tour, we have Ray Charles and David Ritz, Brother Ray, Ray Charles' own story. I think this actually used to belong to an ex-girlfriend of mine, and then, uh, you know, we broke up and she was getting rid of a bunch of her books as she was moving out. And I was like, can, can I have this one, please? So she let me have it, and I read it, and it was very interesting, actually. It's interesting to see Ray Charles' own outlook on the world because obviously he's blind and he was blind since a boy as well and um, he obviously didn't let that stop him but equally because he was blind and a black guy especially like during the time of you know Martin Luther King and all of this stuff it was just really interesting to see his take on things and the ridiculousness of racism because he was like well I can't even see the difference between black and white you know and being blind actually I think kind of put him in a good place to act as a bridge between all these old racist white guys and all these angry young black dudes, you know. Okay, then we have Think Big and Make a Difference, The CPD Way by Sean Chatterton. As you can see, this is pretty big. This dude used to be a client at my first ever company. And basically, he just wrote this book about how... Uh, how he thinks about business or whatever i don't know basically my work was responsible for trying to promote this book i think even though it's awful and it's heavily branded i mean don't get this book let me have the perks of being a wallflower by stephen chaboski and i read this really recently in fact i reviewed it and i'll link to that below and uh i read this on my way back i think it was yeah it was it was on my flight back from latvia when i went to visit uh, riga which i will also link to below but anyway i really love this book actually i think i gave it a five out of five i mean i was 28 by the time i read it and it, it's like a young adult book i guess but it's just incredibly well written charlie the main character in it is super lovable as well and the book is way better than the movie the movie was all right I don't know, I kind of don't see why people would kind of be a fanboy or a fangirl of the movie alone, but I get why you would love the movie if you'd read the book first, if that makes sense. Okay, then we have Tracy Chevalier, The Girl with a Pearl Earring. No, there's no the, it's just Girl with a Pearl Earring. And this is a novel based on the painting by Johan Vermeer uh, of the same name, and this is actually the painting you can see there. And basically it follows a young girl who goes to become one of Vermeer's sort of servants, and then he ends up deciding he wants to paint her. And what's interesting about this book is that I was sent this, well, I, I bought a copy of this, but not knowing what it was. So I bought it from Hannah Tay here on BookTube. She has an Etsy store. And one of the items was Hannah Tay's favorite book. So I bought that and this is what she sent me. And I was not disappointed. It was very good. I think I gave this a five out of five as well. Review link down below. I don't do a huge amount of historical fiction, but this really made me want to read more of the stuff. Now, believe it or not, the rest of this video is all Agatha Christie. So with my Bukowski books, I actually split those up into two videos because they, they kind of span two different shelves. But here, because there was only like four books that wouldn't make it into this video, we're just gonna do the whole lot in one. So going through alphabetically, and some of these I'll remember more than others, we have Agatha Christie, A Caribbean Mystery, which I read this fairly recently, actually. This is interesting because it's a Miss Marple book. She's actually on holiday and she's kind of reluctant really to investigate this mystery as she often is but she ends up getting dragged into it 
And I really liked the actual setting of this as well. I think uh, Christie really captured the kind of Caribbean feel for it. Even for that, there was a bit where she, I think, yeah, Miss Marple fell asleep while a steel band was playing, which I just thought was great. I thought that was very evocative, both of the Caribbean setting and also very telling of Miss Marple's character as well. We have A Murder is Announced, and this is obviously the television series cover for this as well. And um, this one's cool because it starts with the, the kind of premises that in the local paper, an advert goes up saying, uh, oh, it says here on the back, it says, a murder is announced and will take place on Friday, October 29th at Little Paddocks at 6.30 p.m. And uh, so a lot of people show up to see what, what is going on, what, what, what this is all about. And then at 6.30 p.m. at the allotted time and place, all the lights go out and when they come back up, somebody is dead. Okay, then we have a pocket full of rye. This is another Miss Marple one. The one that I remember about this is, uh, well, it says here on the cover, which I don't remember, but, but it says, Gladys, sir, the maid, strangled she was, with a stocking around her throat, been dead for hours, I'd say. And so it's a wicked kind of joke. There was a clothes peg clipped on her nose. Well, obviously a pocket full of rye is one of Christie's kind of nursery rhyme titles and I believe one of the characters is found with a you know literally a pocket full of rye and it plays into the mystery somehow I can't remember exactly how here we have after the funeral and this is a Poirot novel and honestly oh no I do remember this one actually well I'll just read out what it says on the rear, rear, rear cover here it says at the reading of Richard's will Cora was clearly heard to say it's been hushed up very nicely hasn't it but he was murdered wasn't he all right, now we have a really cool one, which not many people probably have this. You'd have to be a bit more of a Christie fan, I think, to get it. So this is Akhenaten. This is a play by Agatha Christie. It's set in ancient Egypt. Uh, he's actually got a testimonial here on the back by Max Mallowan, which is her second husband. He's, uh, he was uh, an archaeologist himself as well, and they were both very interested in the field. He said... Agatha's most beautiful and profound play, brilliant in its delineation of character, tense with drama. The treatment comes as near to historical plausibility as any play about the past can be. And what's interesting is it's basically a murder mystery play set in ancient Egypt. And uh, I mean, I love ancient Egypt. I think it's really fascinating as well. So this was definitely a cool one for me when I, when I finally got to this one. This is Agatha Christie, an autobiography. This is really long. It's uh, the longest of her books by far, as far as I'm aware. Anyway, 560 pages, tiny old uh, print as well. And I really recently read this, like I finished reading it about four days ago at the time of filming. This was a buddy read with books like Woe. So yeah, this is absolutely fascinating. I mean, it does very much focus more on her life than her books, but when her books are influenced by her life, uh, you know, she kind of explains that. It is a dense old read. You wouldn't want to read this early on. You know, you'd want to read a bunch of her books first before getting to this. Still, it was a very good autobiography. It was kind of exactly what I was expecting, really. And uh, yeah, much, much recommended if you're a, a kind of a serious fan. If you have this many of her books, then you kind of need to read her autobiography at this point, you know. Okay, then we have possibly her most famous one, or it was always her most famous one in my mind until the Murder on the Orient Express movie came out, which, by the way, I still haven't read that one. But this is And Then There Were None. It's almost like a locked room mystery, except it's a locked island mystery. So there's 10 people on an island, and then one of them dies, and then there are nine, and then there are eight, and then there are seven. So yeah, and then there were none. And this is just a five star read. I mean, this is possibly the greatest sort of mystery novel ever written, if you ask me. Then we have By the Pricking of My Thumbs, and I have it with this really odd, creepy cover here. I don't remember. Oh, this is a Tommy and Tuppence one. I don't remember this one at all, but. Uh, I mean, the Tommy and Tuppence books aren't her best books. A lot of people don't even know they exist. But basically, you've got her uh, Poirot and her Miss Marple books. And then Tommy and Tuppence are like another detective duo that she created. Here we have Cat Among the Pigeons. And uh, this is a Poirot book. Honestly, I don't remember this one too much either. It's been a while since I read this one. There, among the lacrosse sticks, they stumble upon the body of the unpopular games mistress. Shot through the heart from point-blank range. Here we have Curtain, Poirot's last case. And he actually returns to Styles, which is the scene of the mysterious affair at Styles, which was both Poirot's first case and um, Agatha Christie's first ever book. And yeah, this is the last one. This is where it all ends. And I mean, it's not the best of the books, actually, but it's obviously it's an important one. Then we have Dead Man's Folly. And this is all about basically there is like a village fate being held. And there's a woman called Ariadne Oliver. She's a local mystery writer and she's organizing a, like a murder mystery experience, I guess, at this at this fair. 
Only then somebody does turn up actually dead. And uh, Poirot comes along to this one. There's also a computer game, one of the Telltale games, you know, point and click investigation games based on this one, which is very good as well. I recommend the game. All right, next up we have Death Comes as the End. And this isn't this beautiful little kind of hardback edition. I really like this actually. So Death Comes as the End is another one of the kind of Egyptian style ones. So this is another kind of Egyptian murder mystery, but this one's a novel rather than a play. And I actually don't remember this anywhere near as much as Aknart and the play. I really did enjoy that one. So I'd probably recommend that one. Speaking of Egyptian stuff, then we have Death on the Nile, which is Poirot. It's another one of my favourite Christie books. Basically, there's a voyage happening as uh, people go down the Nile on a boat. And there is death there. And there is also a Telltale Games version of this as well, which is also very fun. But equally, this is just kind of... I guess... It, I guess it's like a family inheritance because my mom really likes this one too because she's Egypt mad. So am I. Here we have Endless Nights. This doesn't have a blurb and I don't remember it so I cannot tell you a single thing about this one. Then we have Five Little Pigs and this is this this is a Poirot one that goes off the whole uh, you know this little piggy went to market I believe. It says beautiful Caroline Crail was convicted of poisoning her husband yet there were five other suspects. Philip Blake the stockbroker who went to market Meredith Blake, the amateur herbalist who stayed at home. Elsa Greer, the three-time divorcee who had roast beef. Cecilia Williams, the devoted governess who had none. And Angela Warren, the disfigured sister, who cried wee 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 all the way home. It is 16 years later, but Hercule Poirot just can't get that nursery rhyme out of his mind. Here we have Lord Edgware dies, and I actually don't remember this one particularly well, but this is one of the really famous Poirot ones. I guess... To me, it wasn't as memorable as the others. I think this is probably one of the early ones that I read as well. All right, this is Miss Marple's Final Cases. I actually read and reviewed this one fairly recently since having my booktube channel, and I gave this a five out of five. I actually think Marple works really well in short stories. I know these are her final cases, but it's actually also quite a good way to introduce yourself to her as a character. I mean, you don't have to read them all chronologically. Yeah, I just like here that there's a wide variety of different stories as well, like, I don't know, it doesn't feel repetitive. I think there's a risk with short stories when they're short mystery stories that they can start to get quite repetitive, but Chrissy manages to keep them all fresh here. And one of them is actually effectively written by Marple herself as well, so you get her her point of view on it. Here we have Passenger to Frankfurt. This it says here, Passenger to Frankfurt is the book Agatha Christie wrote to mark her 80th birthday. The queen of crime turns her hand to international intrigue and a highly topical plot that sweeps across Europe, carrying with it a host of riotous characters. Must admit, don't really remember this one, but I guess this is more of like a more of like a spy novel than the others, I guess. Here we have Peril End House. This is uh, probably one another one of the most well-known ones, I would say. This one is all about a kind of a series of accidents that turn out to maybe not be accidents. It's another Poirot novel, and I actually feel like I'm due a reread of this one because this is another one of the the ones that I read. Kind of when I was just getting into Christie, I really enjoyed it, but it's been so long since I read it that I could read it again and, you know, I wouldn't get spoiled for who the murderer was or anything like that. Okay, here we have Agatha Christie poems. So not a lot of people realise that she also wrote poetry as well. I mean, this is a beat-up old copy. This is actually from the Nyack Library in New York, 1973. The flint it was our weapon, the circle was our home. The tours closed in around us and we never dared to roam. The flint it was our weapon and we kept the beasts at bay. When there came on us the seamen, the roving northern freemen, and closed in all around us as we fled in wild dismay. This book really smells, so I'm going to put it down now. Poirot's early cases. So I guess this kind of looks at Poirot when he was younger. I have no idea what's going on with this thing on the front, but that is freaking terrifying. It actually reminds me of the metamorphosis or something there. Here we have Poston of Fate. This is another Tommy and Tuppence one. And... I think this is when they were at, at, at their oldest, maybe. Oh, yeah. It says here, Poston of Fate was the last book she wrote before her death in 1976. As this was the last one that she wrote, it's interesting because Tommy and Tuppence kind of aged alongside her. So whereas Poirot and Marple kind of started old and just remained old, Tommy and Tuppence started young and then get into their 70s or 80s or whatever. So at this point, they're pretty much the same age as, as Agatha Christie was herself. So I think that's the main thing that marks this one out as being interesting. I would say of the Tommy and Tuppence books that I've read, it was my favourite, but that's not saying much, to be honest. 
You, you're probably not going to want to read the Tommy and Tuppence ones unless you're a completionist and want to read all of her books, which is what I'm currently trying to do, as you can see. In fact, I think Agatha Christie is my most read female author. Okay, then we have Sleeping Murder. And this is when, uh, this is another Marvel book. I actually read this one quite recently. And the main character in this sort of, she thinks she remembers this murder and she can't re remember whether it was a dream or not or whether she did actually see it. Next up we have The Rose and the Yew Tree, which is more of a romance novel. This was written under the pseudonym of Mary Westmacott. I actually really enjoyed this. Like, I mean, I'm not really much of a romance reader, but this was, I mean, it was kind of like a society romance rather than, what you see today, you know. So for example here, let me read the blurb here, just the next up. Everyone expected Isabella Charteris, beautiful, sheltered and aristocratic, to marry her cousin Rupert when he came back from the war. It would have been such a suitable marriage. How strange then that John Gabriel, an ambitious and ruthless war hero, should appear in her life. So I think that's what made this interesting for me is not necessarily the romance itself, but the kind of the setting of it and the way that it examined the society at the time. Then we have The Regatta Mystery and other stories, and this features Miss Marple, Hercule Poirot, and Mr. Parker Pine. So we have, uh, I've forgotten about Parker Pine, actually. That's another one of her kind of B-list characters, I guess, but the, many people do still love him, you know. And this is just a great little collection to get a nice mixture, I suppose. I probably wouldn't start with this, but if, you're, if you've read half a dozen of Christie's books and you want to... You know, maybe if you've only ever read Poirot or something, this is a good way to get your fix of Poirot whilst also getting to meet Miss Marple and some other people. Here we have The Mystery of the Blue Train, and <laughs> in her autobiography, she talks about how she hadn't even really wanted to read this book and how she hates it and thinks it's one of her worst and stuff. But it is also one that a lot of people like. Personally, I do not remember it at all. And uh, it is a Poirot book, though, so there's that. All right, then we have another one of the fairly well-known ones. This is The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. It says here, Mrs. Ferrers poisoned her husband, but no one suspected her except her blackmailer until she committed suicide, leaving a letter to the man she loved. Roger Ackroyd never finished reading it, for the blackmailer had turned to a new crime, murder, and no one suspected him either. No one but Hercule Poirot. Then we have The Murder on the Links. This is the second ever Poirot book, so this comes straight after The Mysterious Affair at Styles. Even at the time that she wrote this book, she didn't necessarily consider herself a serious novelist, but it's definitely, I mean, it's a good effort. I would be quite happy to write a book like this, so kudos to her. Okay, then we have The Moving Finger, and uh, this, oh, this is about a suicide, but it might not actually be a suicide, and I can't re recall the, the, the meaning of the moving finger for some reason, but I d it's not been long at all since I read this, so I guess it's not one that massively stuck in my head. I mean, I do remember this, so uh, Mrs. Symington commits suicide. Her final note says I can't go on, but still Miss Marple questions the coroner's verdict of suicide. Soon, nobody is sure of anyone, as secrets stop becoming shameful and start being deadly. Here we have The Labours of Hercules, and this is kind of cool because it's about Hercule Poirot, but also it compares it to the labours of Hercules. Let me just read this out. In appearance, Hercule Poirot hardly resembled an ancient Greek hero. Yet, reasoned the detective, like Hercules, he'd been responsible for ridding society of some of its most unpleasant monsters. So, in the period leading up to his retirement, Poirot made up his mind to accept just 12 more cases, his self-imposed labours. Each one would go down in the annals of crime as a heroic feat of deduction. And what's cool is this is kind of based on the labours of Hercu uh, Hercules, but in the same way that her nursery rhyme books are based on the nursery rhymes, so they're not really, but they do tie back to them in a, in a, in a, in a way. So, for example, there is one about, uh, 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 you know, well, there we go. The first one is the story of the Nemean lion, except it's obviously not just a retelling of the Nemean lion, but there is something to do with the lion in there. Here we have The Hound of Death and other stories. Now, these are stories by a world-famous detective story writer, but not detective stories this time. So these are more mystery and supernatural stories. I do remember these, actually. They are. They're almost like classic horror. I think they reminded me of kind of Henry James and stuff like that. Then we have The Golden Ball and other stories. It was an offer that St. Vincent's could not refuse. A splendid mansion, complete with servants, with nothing asked in return. But where was the host? Why was the mysterious butler as tight-lipped and enigmatic as the Sphinx? Most of the family basking in elegance is content to ask no questions, but young Rupert St. Vincent suspects a sinister trap and will not rest until he has unmasked the mastermind behind it all. All right, then we have the ABC murders, and this was all based on, like, somebody with an, an A name was based in an A place and someone with a B name was placed 
killed in a B place. So, for example, Bob Brown would be killed in Brighton. As I'm Dane Cobain, I should steer clear of Coventry. Here we have the Sitterford Mystery. Uh, I don't remember it, but it says here. Six people in darkness around a table. Slowly the table begins to rock. The message is clear. Trevelyan is dead. Barnaby, a close friend, discovers the awful truth. Murder has hit the peaceful Dartmoor village of Sitterford. A broken window, a burning light, and a corpse. It all began as a harmless amusement for those six people. Now the game has turned sour. Inspector Narricot wanders through a maze of false clues and suspects in his baffling quest to find the murderer behind the Sitterford mystery. Here we have three act tragedy, and this is a Poirot story, and I like here, I mean it mirrors the three act nature of a play. It even does, here you can see in the contents look, so contents, first act, a few chapters, second act, a few chapters, etc. And again, cracking story, one of the first ones that I read, and um, yeah, I mean, sorry about the rip there, by the way, but uh, yeah, good, good one, good one, that. And the last book I'm going to share with you today is While the Light Lasts, and this is a collection, again, of some of her uh, short fiction. I read this one fairly recently, I did enjoy it, actually. It says here, this new collection brings together nine stories that, with a couple of exceptions, have not previously been reissued since their original publication, in some cases 60 to 70 years ago. So this is just an interesting way of getting hold of, you know, some of the more obscure short stories that she wrote. So there we have it. We made it through another bookshelf tour. So next time we are going to have, oh God, we've got, we've got Cassandra Clare down there. We've got J.G. Clay, who is an indie author friend of mine. We have this dude called Dane Cobain. I, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's pretty obscure, to be honest. Oh, we also have Kurt Cobain, Jarvis Cocker, Leonard Cohen, <laughs> and Stephen Colgan. So, if thanks a lot for watching. As always, if you've enjoyed this video, hit that like button. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, and if so, which ones of them have been your favourites. Hit that subscribe button if you're new here, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.